let's look at some applications of least squares. This is where you finally start to see how powerful and versatile least squares is. So once again, we have our equation here, y equals ax. A is matrix with m rows and n columns, and x and y are vectors that make this matrix equation make sense. So let's look at the statistical interpretation of least squares. So what I mean is, if A is skinny, then we have what is called an overdetermined system of equations. This is just a technical way of saying that we have more constraints than variables. Now, each row of A could be measurements that we obtain from sensor readings. So instead of just looking at this equation in terms of abstract numbers, let's look at this in terms of sensors. So Y, in this case, would be target values that we want to reach by, for example, combining the sensor readings, right? And then the way that we combine them is represented by x. We take linear combinations of the columns of A and weight them by the values of x, and we add them together to get y. So now let's add this term v at the end of this. This makes this equation uh, more precise. So v is a vector of noise. What I mean is, V accounts for the mismatch between y and ax, right? So before, the equal sign between y and ax, it wasn't really an equal sign. y doesn't quite equal ax, right? Because we're assuming that not all the equations um, will be satisfied, right? And that lack of everything being satisfied is represented by V. So if A uh, is formed by taking sensor readings, um, and then we take linear combinations of those sensor readings, we can add some sort of measurement error or noise to represent everything that's not modeled by this equation. Um, or, you know, just problems with our measurement apparatus. And by adding that vector v, we account for the difference between y and ax. Okay, so now the equal sign here really is an equal sign. It's not y is approximately equal to ax. It's y exactly equals ax plus v, this noise vector. Okay, so now, in this case, the least square solution, xls, that is our estimate of what x is in the presence of this noise. So this vector v, we can't see it, right? It's, it's something we, we presume to be there. Uh, what we observe is just y um, and a, right? So we want to recover x, but we can't recover x perfectly in the presence of noise, right? We just give our best effort, and the best effort in this case is the least square solution. So if we multiply a by xls, we will get not the original y, but y hat, which is something very, very close to y, right? It's, a, it's our estimate of y. Um, and xls, uh, let's denote it by x hat. We don't know the true x, right? It's, it's muddled by this noise vector v. But we can recover it uh, somewhat by doing the least squares uh, procedure. And we call this xls, but in general, you know, we could use any sort of estimation procedure. It doesn't have to be least squares. It could be something else. And, you know, it could just be a random guess. So uh, our estimate of x, we will call this x hat. So in this specific case, our x hat just equals xls. But um, I'm going to use this sort of formalism of x hat, y hat to talk about the statistical interpretation. Okay, so now we, we sort of get to the punchline here. Let's consider the difference between the true value and our estimate of x. Right, so we can't really perfectly recover x in the presence of noise, but let's consider how far away we are from this true value. Uh, this difference, um, let's just, you know, call this x minus x hat, and let's just plug in all the equations here. So x hat is just the pseudo inverse of a multiplied by y. So x minus x hat equals x minus a dagger y. Okay, so let's actually plug in what y is, and y is just from the last equation. We get x minus a dagger times the quantity ax plus v. So now we just distribute the minus a dagger, and we get x minus a dagger ax minus a dagger v. Okay, so now here's the trick. Let's actually substitute the value of a dagger here uh, to the second term. So we get x minus the inverse of a transpose a times a transpose a x minus a dagger v. Okay, so now look very carefully at this middle term here. Uh, we have a transpose a, which is just another matrix, right? We have the inverse of that times 
itself times x. So um, in other words, we just have the identity matrix here times x. We get x minus x minus a dagger v. So obviously the x's cancel and we're left with just negative a dagger v. All right, so that whole thing just reduced to x minus x hat equals minus a dagger v. All right, so what does this tell us? So the difference between x and x hat is dependent on just two things. It's dependent on the pseudo inverse of a, and it's dependent on the noise vector v. Just to clean things up here, here's our equation again. And uh, think about what happens if we have no noise. All right, if we have no noise or measurement error, then the right-hand side becomes just entirely zero. So x hat, our estimate of x, is equal exactly to x, the true value of x. Right? And this makes sense. Right? If there is no noise or measurement error, everything is perfect. Right? Um, we just look at y and a, and we can perfectly recover the true value of x. And the least square solution will give us that. So that's great. But, you know, uh, life is usually not so clean. So we have noise usually. Um, but if noise is not there, and x hat gives us x, then this property, uh, there's a special term for this, we say that x hat is an unbiased estimator of x. So now let me mention a little bit of uh, technical jargon here. Um, but this, I think, is really interesting. We saw in a previous step that a dagger a is just the identity matrix, right? If you actually plug in what a dagger is, you'll see that everything uh, cancels out and you just get the identity matrix, right? So now instead of a dagger, let's consider just any matrix B. Any matrix B that just inverts uh, A. So in other words, some B that satisfies this equation here. B A equals I. So now the pseudo inverse of A might not be the only equation that satisfies this, right? So that's why I'm using the letter B here. Um, it's for any possible matrix that satisfies this equation. Basically, what I'm trying to do here is show why the pseudo inverse of A is a special matrix. So A dagger is one of these B matrices, right? So A dagger, you can substitute for B here, and you know this equation would hold. But my point here is that A dagger is the smallest matrix that can invert A. If I use any other matrix B, right, that satisfies this equation, uh, that matrix B will be bigger than A dagger. So what am I talking about here? What does smallest or biggest matrix mean? Okay, so there's a very specific technical sense. Look at this next equation. All I'm doing here is that I'm squaring each element of the matrix B and adding those all together, right? So the left-hand side here is I'm summing over all indices I and J, and I go to the ith row and the jth column of B, I take whatever elements there, I square it, and I go through all the different I and J indices, and I add those all together, and I get one number. And on the right-hand side, I have A dagger, and I just do the same thing there. So here's a fact. So I'm just going to state it without proof, but um, if you look at all the possible matrices B that satisfy the top equation, you're always going to get the bottom equation to be true. So if you square and sum all the terms of any matrix B, they will always be equal to or greater than that same operation done on the pseudo inverse, right? Basically, the elements are closer to zero than the elements of any other matrix B that satisfies this equation. So in that very narrow, specific sense, A dagger is the smallest matrix that can invert A. This is important because if we go back to the last slide here, um, you know, the difference between x and x hat is negative A dagger V. So if our noise V is small, then the difference will be small between x and x hat, right? But we don't have control over V. V is just nature, right? It's just stuff we haven't modeled. It's stuff that, that can go wrong. But the matrix A, and consequently the matrix A dagger, that represents our system. That Those are our constraints, right? So if we make A dagger small in the technical sense we just described, then A dagger V is going to be small. And so the difference between X and X hat is going to be small. In plain English, this means that A dagger is the matrix that propagates noise the least. The difference between x and x hat, in other words, you know, how, how bad we are at uh, reaching the true value of x, 
This is determined by how a dagger propagates the noise v. Now we wrap everything together into this nice statement. The least square solution is the best linear unbiased estimator of x. All right, so that's a mouthful, but we already covered what an unbiased estimator was, right? If there's no noise, if v is zero, then least squares will give us back the true value of x. But in the case of noise, right, a dagger is the smallest matrix um, that will satisfy the equation. So in that sense, it's the best. And the word linear there, the estimate x hat is a linear function of y. Everything's linear here, right? So just putting everything together, once again, the least square solution is the best linear unbiased estimator of x. So that's an acronym called BLUE. And um, if you want to get into the details, uh, the proof is, is given by the Gauss-Markov theorem. Uh, it's a very interesting theorem. I'm not going to go over here, but uh, feel free to look it up. And uh, it basically yeah, states, states what we just said here. So there are a few other statistical conditions that we need to satisfy um, for this to really be true. Um, but most of the time, these are pretty reasonable assumptions. So I've only just gone over the ones that I think are uh, the most relevant. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to dig more into this, please look at the Gauss-Markov theorem. Okay, so now we've seen the statistical interpretation of least squares. Let's look at an actual application. Here's a very interesting one. Um, it has to do with temperature estimation. So we have this 2D floor plan of a room, and you know, I've got some furniture laid around here. And what I'm trying to do is estimate the temperature of the room um, as accurately as possible. So I have these red sensors, these four sensors, um, attached to the wall at these locations. And these sensors, they are uh, cheap, but not very accurate sensors. And in the middle, I have this yellow sensor, which is accurate, but it's extremely expensive. So basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to combine the readings from the red sensors in some optimal way uh, to try to match the reading from the yellow sensor as much as possible. So I'm trying to measure the temperature of this room, and really what I want to know is the temperature at the center of the room, right? That's where people are going to be walking around. That's the temperature that we really want to control. But this yellow sensor, uh, let's say it's some really, really big, uh, kind of clunky sensor, um, and that's why it's so accurate. Um, we can't just uh, leave it there in the middle of the room, right? Um, first of all, you know, it'd be, it'd be really expensive to do so, but it just gets in the way. And we want something more subtle and something cheaper. So we use these red sensors um, scattered uh, along the walls. You know, once again, red sensors are cheap, but not very accurate. Yellow sensor is accurate, but very expensive. And the problem is, can we combine several cheap sensors to form an accurate temperature estimate? Let's describe this with an equation. So Y is going to be the reading given by the expensive accurate sensor, the yellow sensor. And A1, A2, A3, A4 are the readings taken by the cheap temperature sensors. And for the A's and the Y, um, these are all taken at one instance in time. You know, 12 noon, we take readings from all the sensors, all five sensors, right? And we get Y, A1 uh, through A4. And the problem is we're trying to find x1, x2, x3, x4. Um, these are the coefficients we put in front of the a's um, so that we scale the a's and sum them together to match y as closely as possible. And the problem is how do we determine these weights x1, x2, x3, x4? So this is the equation for just one given instant of time. So here's the trick. Let's collect measurements from all the sensors, all five sensors at many different times, right? Not just 12 noon, but 3.15 p.m., uh, 7 p.m., 3 in the morning, maybe several days, maybe several weeks. And the more measurements we collect, the more accurate our estimate of the weights are gonna be. And the thing is, we can stack all these measurements into one big system of equations. So writing this out for the abstract case, you know, let's say we have m different times that we take these measurements, we're gonna have m different values for the Y sensor, right? The yellow one, that's the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side for the matrix A, each row of A is a different instance of time, right? We have M different times, those are the M different rows, and the N different columns 
each column corresponds to one of the four sensors in our example, well, one of the four red cheap sensors, right? So in this case, we have n columns or n sensors. And uh, finally, to wrap things up, on the right-hand side, we have um, our weights. This is our vector x. It goes from x1 to xn, so we have one x for each different sensor. Basically, our problem here is to find the optimal values of x. So let's look at some actual code here. So um, I've got uh, two different scripts here I'm going to go over. So first, uh, let's look at the temp estimation script here. All right, so um, very short Python script. And you know all this code and the slides, uh, you can find them in a GitHub repo. Um, and there's a link in the description that goes to that. So um, there's, there's really not much. Um, this is great because. Uh, least squares, you know, I think you can tell by now, it's it's actually pretty simple, right? The hard part is setting up the matrix A. So taking a word problem and actually uh, changing the form so that it becomes y equals ax, that part is really not trivial. That is the hardest part. But once you've figured out that form, you know, you just take the pseudo inverse and you're done. And in code, we can just use numpy. So here I've just imported the array, but also um, from numpy.linalg, I'm importing lstsq, so that's least squares, and that is great because it is just such a simple function to use. So I have some values here that I made up for the temperature estimation example. So I have this uh, y array here, and these are temperatures taken at six different times. And you know, in practice, we'd want to use many, many different times, but uh, for simplicity, I'm just going to use six. And these are temperature measurements in degrees Celsius. On the first time, I measured uh, with the yellow sensor here 20.3 degrees Celsius, right? And then on the last time, it was 22.9. Now for the matrix A, I have six rows corresponding to the six different times. And I have four columns for the four different sensors. And you can see that the sensors are really not accurate, right? So for the first time, um, the yellow sensor says that it's 20.3, but these sensors, they're kind of all over the place, right? Um, this first sensor, um, it consistently um, underestimates what the temperature is. It always thinks it's colder, right? And then um, on the right-hand side here, uh, the 21.4, for example. So this column, this fourth sensor, it consistently overestimates the temperature. So uh, to sort of surmise some physical explanation for this, uh, maybe the first sensor, which is always uh, underestimating things, uh, maybe it's near some air conditioning vent. And maybe it's just always picking up some draft, so it always thinks uh, the room is colder than it really is. And then for the fourth sensor, let's say it's near one of the sofas, so people often sit there and it picks up body heat and for that reason, it always thinks the room is hotter than it really is. Okay, so these sensors are not as accurate, but maybe we can combine them in some way to get very close to the accurate sensor that is represented by Y. Right, so we have Y and A, and that's really all we need. So this one line here, this one line solves everything. So X, this is our X hat, right? It equals uh, least square, and we put in A as the first argument, um, then Y, and then this third thing here, R con equals none. Um, you can look into the NumPy documentation for that, but um, if you pass none, then it will just omit uh, a warning message. So, um, you know, just so you don't clutter your screen, I recommend that you do that. And the output, um, there are actually a few different outputs, but the one that we care about is the first output, the zeroth one. So this is the actual least squares estimate of x, right? And then last thing here, I just computed the difference between um, the true value of y and the estimated value of y, y hat, right? So y hat is just um, a multiplied by x, right? Um, x hat. So this tells us how off we were in terms of um, matching the yellow sensor. So uh, at the end here, I just print these two terms. So let's actually run this. Um, just do python3 temp estimation.py. And uh, what we have here is, okay, first line, least squares estimate of x. And we have 
four different numbers here, right? This is x1, x2, x3, x4. So these are the different weights that we scale each of the four sensors by, the four cheap sensors, and then we add these sensors together to get our estimate of y. So this right here is already very interesting because the first weight here is very close to zero. Right, so this is telling us that the first sensor is basically useless. We should kind of just ignore it. But then on the other side here, uh, so like the third and fourth sensors, uh, these are you know kind of close to 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So this means that we are putting a lot of emphasis on what sensor 3 and sensor 4 are saying, right? So these sensors tend to be more accurate. And actually, um, by giving them roughly equal weight, we do better than just looking at each sensor individually, right? And just one last thing here, uh, this first term, it's not perfectly zero, right? So it's not like the first sensor is completely useless. It's mostly useless, but um, it's nice to have it in there, right? It contributes a little bit, right? So least squares um, has found that this, uh, these weights here uh, produces the best the optimal combination of the four sensors. And just to wrap things up, the difference between the true and the estimated y, the true and the estimated uh, value for the temperature of the center of the room, is given by uh, this vector here, right? So we have six elements in the vector, one for each of the different times, and we see how close we were um, for each of those times, right? So if you look here, uh, remember that these are in units of degrees Celsius, right? All of them are actually below um, 0.5, right? So half a degree Celsius in terms of absolute value. So that's pretty good. You know, we're only half a degree off um, in the worst case, right? So in the in the last time here, we're you know off by negative um, 0.47. But in some cases, we're actually you know doing really really well, right? Like this one, um, like 0.1 of a degree Celsius, right? So in general, we're doing pretty well here. And this is pretty amazing because we don't need to use this uh, expensive yellow sensor anymore, right? We can just use the cheap sensors, the small sensors that are mounted on the wall, and we can get a pretty good estimate of the center temperature of the room. And we would not have been able to accomplish this without least squares. All right, now let's look at a very different application. This is polynomial fitting. So imagine we have some time series data. And this just means that uh, input is time and output is data. And we can try fitting some polynomial to the data. So for example, let's just use a cubic. And here's the equation for some general cubic. And we have y equals at cubed plus bt squared plus ct plus d. And t is time. And a, b, c, d are just constants. And what we're trying to do here is to find the best values for the coefficients a, b, c, d, right? And, and what we mean by best is that we fit the data as closely as possible using um, this polynomial. If we have data at many different times, then we can actually compute some pretty good estimates of these four coefficients. Okay, so here's our equation again. But now let me manipulate this equation to make it a little more suggestive so that we can put this into some y equals ax uh, matrix equation form. So it's not really clear right now how to do this, but let's take it step by step. So I'm going to actually rearrange the terms here. So I'm going to do the lowest order term first and the highest order term last. And this is not really necessary, but it's going to be clear in a minute why I'm doing this. So I've arranged it like this, and here's the trick. So I am actually going to replace d with 1 times d. You know, obviously, that's still legal. But now, I think it becomes clearer that this is actually the inner product of two vectors. So let me write these vectors this way. So y is the product of this first vector, which is just 1, t, t squared, t cubed, and then the second vector, which is just dcba. So dcba, that vector on the right, that is the vector that we're trying to estimate. We're trying to find the optimal values of those four coefficients. And the left-hand side vector, we just take one for the first element, and for the other elements, we're doing the successive powers of t. So now if I have many different times, so I have many different data points, many different y's at specific t's, then I can just stack everything into one big y equals ax equation. Um, on the left-hand side, I have the different data points. So I have the first data point y1 all the way to the nth 
data point ym and the matrix a here this is very interesting because i have the first column as just once all the way down just once and the second column are the different times right so the first time t1 and then t2 all the way down to the mth time tm and then the following columns are just the successive powers of uh, each of the times right and then at the very end i have x1 through xn and this is just the coefficients right so the dcba i'm just replacing with x here um, to make everything more suggestive before we go on uh, i just want to mention that this matrix a um, this structure has a very special name so a matrix that follows this structure where we, we have the first column as one and then the other columns are just successive powers this type of matrix is called a vandermond matrix and uh, this vandermond matrix will show up many times it'll show up in lots of different applications right not just polynomial fitting okay so let's look at an application of that sort of polynomial fitting using least squares so what i'm going to do here is some very simple gdp forecasting i'm going to look at um, the world gdp at 10 year intervals between 1970 and 2020 and i'm going to use that to fit a cubic polynomial to the data and finally i'm going to use that to predict the world gdp in 2030 I have some data here that I just pulled from Google. I'm just going to use uh, this data and NumPy to do all of that least squares polynomial fitting. So going back to our terminal here, I'm just going to clear the screen and I'm going to use the GDP polynomial fitting.py script here. So this is also a very short script. Um, again, at the top, just importing the same things, importing least squares. And a couple things here, I'm going to measure time in a special way. I'm going to measure it in years since 1970, right? So I could choose basically, you know, whatever um, origin I want, but just um, to make the numbers look uh, not as crazy, I'm just going to use 1970 as zero. And then I'm going to measure world GDP in terms of trillions of USD. And this is also just to keep the numbers small. So I'm just going to use six different values here. Uh, I'm going to use the world GDP, like I said, at 10 year successive intervals from 1970 to 2020 and that forms my vector y of target values so 1970 the world gdp was 3.4 trillion right and then in 2020 um, it was 84.9 trillion and then i have my matrix a which you now know is a vandermont matrix the first column is just ones and this column of ones it represents the constant term right the d term the offset and uh the second column here uh, these are the t values right um, they're not raised to any power it's just t so zero the first row here this is the year since 1970 so just zero here and then zero squared zero cubed right and then in 1980 10 years have passed so i do 10 10 squared etc right and i keep going until i get to uh, 2020 and in that case it's 50 and you get the point so i just solve this with one line here again just x equals least square um, a y and I'm just going to print that. That will give me um, x hat here, which is the a, b, c, d. And then I'm going to show you the difference between the true value of y and the y hat that I estimated, right? So this will give me how many trillions of dollars I am off for um, fitting the polynomial, right? And then finally, um, this is the exciting part. I'm going to predict the GDP in 2030. And all I'm doing here is I created this vector, which is 60 years from 1970 so 2030 and i'm just dotting it with x hat and i'm just printing that so let's come out of this and just do python gdp.py and here we go so first line here least squares estimate of x so i did not round the numbers here and let me spend just a few seconds talking about that so when you're doing uh, estimation stuff in general, you want to be very careful about rounding and significant figures. So, you know, you take a chemistry class, you take, you know, whatever. People will tell you, oh, yeah, you got to round to no more than your least precise number, right? But the thing is, um, it's not so cut and clear in statistics because if you don't keep all of these significant figures, you will not get the numbers to match. So if you want people to actually reproduce your work, um, it's best to just give lots of significant figures. Um, because, for example, in this case, we're dealing with very big numbers, right? We're dealing with like 50 cubed, 60 cubed, right? And we're using that to fit the data. So if you round this like 4.2, blah, 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 to just 
like four or even to like 4.21 even just rounding it that much um, it's just gonna give you terrible uh, fitting results for the polynomial so um, it's better just to report a bunch of different digits and uh, the person who is using your code can decide for themselves how many significant figures uh, they want to use so we have these four different coefficients and um, the first term here this is the constant term this is a constant offset of 4.21 trillion dollars and the next term here uh, this is the linear term and then we have uh, the quadratic term right so uh, be careful here this is uh, 10 to the minus 2 right so these are getting pretty small and then we have the cubic term finally so this is also pretty small 10 to the minus 4 um, but even though these are small keep in mind that you know we're dealing with 50 cubed 60 cubed right so uh, this term is very important so you don't want to uh, round this too much. Okay, so next we get the difference between the true and estimated y. So this is how closely our polynomial fits the actual um, GDP data. So for 1970, our estimate and the true value, um, they differ by negative 0.81 trillion dollars. So that's actually not that bad because the 1970 GDP was between uh, 3 and 4 trillion dollars. And the next 10-year year interval here, 1980, it's off by 1.76 and so on. And these are actually not that bad. You know, they're off by, you know, in, in this uh, worst case here, right? $5.67 trillion, right? But this is not that bad because, you know, we're dealing with dozens of trillions of dollars. And considering how crude this model is, right? It's just a cubic. We're getting very close. Finally, if we predict the world GDP in 2030, just by following this polynomial, we just plug in 2030 minus 1970. And we will get that the prediction is 112.9 trillion USD. So maybe come back in eight years and let me know if this prediction is correct. But this seems pretty reasonable, right? This is not a crazy estimate. Um, so of course, to really accurately predict world GDP, you need to take into account, you know, a whole slew of factors. But this is pretty crazy considering how rudimentary and crude our data is, right? We just use six data points, that's it. Um, but we got something that's... Um, pretty reasonable using just least squares. So I hope this shows you uh, some of the versatility that least squares can provide you. All right, very last application here. I'm not going to go into a numerical example, but I'll just briefly mention what's going on here. So this is an application that I really find interesting, and it's image alignment. So I have these two images of this building here, and they are from different viewpoints in 3D. And I'm trying to figure out how the camera was rotated and translated between these two different viewpoints. And I can use some computer vision algorithms to figure out some points in the two images that seem to match. So these yellow lines, they're ending on key points, they're called. And these key points are like unique points that are on the image that can be matched to some other image. So, I don't know, for example, the top of the triangle at the very top of the building, there's a key point that is matched there between the two images. So there's something unique about the way the color is arranged at these two points that allows the uh, key point algorithm to say, yeah, you know, these are actually the same point, just from different viewpoints. Once we are given these uh, different key points, um, we can use those points to figure out the optimal transformation between these two images. This may sound a little bit similar to some of the robotic stuff we were talking about earlier, and it's actually very similar in terms of the math. So the exciting thing is that we can actually use least squares to find how the camera moved between these two images. The thing is, we can only do this for affine cameras. And an, an affine camera, which I'll explain in a later lecture, is just a very simple model for a camera. It's not that realistic, but it makes the math pretty and it allows us to use least squares. So right now, with the linear algebra that we have at hand, we can just deal with affine cameras. But the thing is, what we really want to do is use projective cameras. So these are uh, much more realistic, and um, they're basically how real cameras work. Um, but to do this, least squares is not enough. We need something called the singular value decomposition, which we will talk all about um, in a later lecture. And once we have that tool, we will come back to this, and I will show you how to do this image alignment with some real data. So that was a taste of a few different problems that you can solve using least squares, and I hope it gave you some sort of sense of just how broad least squares is. And I think the key takeaway here is that the hard part is setting up y equals ax. And I hope you realize that it requires a little bit of creativity to sort of massage the problem into this y equals ax form. Um, it's not at all trivial, 
But once you have found that form, then just solving for the least square solution of x is trivial. It's one line of code in Python. So let's step back for a minute. So I mentioned a new term at the very beginning of this lecture, and that was overdetermined system, right? We have more constraints than variables. But next time, we're going to look at the other problem. What if we don't have enough constraints? What if we have fewer constraints than variables? This is called an underdetermined system. And there's something called the least norm solution, which is analogous to least squares, but it's looking at things from the other side. And this least norm solution is equally useful. So next time, we'll see what least norm is all about. We'll derive it, and we'll look at an interesting application.